Please pray with me before I offer a message. Gracious, loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning we continue our journey through the book of Exodus. Uh, we last week read about the Ten Commandments and those laws that were given to Moses. We walked through all ten of them and saw the challenges that they brought to God's people and the invitation to love their God and one another above all else. Today we see how quickly people fall away from this kind of path and how fickle the human heart can be in our devotion to God. Within just those 40 days that Moses was on the mountain getting those commandments, receiving them from God's Spirit, the people at the foot of the mountain were already betraying their God, breaking the covenant with God. They broke the first two commandments before they even had a chance to read what they were. They read these, they, they broke the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol. They did both of these before they could even receive the stone tablets from the mountain. Stories like this seem foreign to us at first. We don't really uh, worship idols, physical idols. We don't necessarily think of ourselves as chasing after gods like this, this calf, which was meant to symbolize the, the god Baal, a competing god from that region. But we are inclined still today to worship lesser gods, to give our devotion to things that are less meaningful, to allow our faith in the one true God to falter for one reason or another. Sometimes we love to escape this reality. We love to find one escape or another. This can become some kind of a lesser God. Um, for, for example, some of us escape about 10 minutes to the west and go to the happiest place on earth and uh, enjoy that place. And uh, for some people, that becomes a kind of a religion, as a matter of fact. But uh, that's, that's fine, and it's an enjoyable thing um, as long as we do keep things in perspective. Some of our vices, some of our escapes are um, okay for our health. Some are harmful to body and spirit. And we keep track of these things. We are mindful of how we are affected when we give obedience to these other gods. Today's a good Sunday to think about the difference between a, a Ten Commandment faith, as we read about last week, a faith that commands us to love God with all that we are and love our neighbor in all of these different ways that the Ten Commandments outlines, the difference between that and a shallow faith, a superstitious faith, a faith in a golden calf, uh, a cheap thing that promises immediate results. People weren't willing to wait those 40 days for Moses to come down from the mountain. They weren't w willing to wait for what God would really say to them, so they made something up. They took the earrings off of their wives' ears. Uh, probably the wives weren't amused by that, and uh, threw them into the fire, and a golden calf came out, and they said, this is our God. This is the one who freed us from slavery in Egypt. We might think of our own lives and what we give our devotion to. Is it the one true God? Is our faith in God alone? Or do we allow our hearts to be devoted first to some lesser God, some other escape, some vice, some object of our affection? Sometimes we even find that shallow faith can enter into the Christian religion itself. Sometimes the practice of Christian faith can become very shallow or even superstitious. We worship God with the hope and expectation that we'll have immediate results, that God will bless us and reward us in some material sense because we have done the right thing. Sometimes we hear bad theology preached like this in, in the church. Uh, this kind of faith is the subject of a story, also known as a joke, that a friend of mine told me yesterday about two engaged people, they, this, um, this young man and woman who were engaged to be married, Things became serious, and she invited the, um, the young man to meet her parents at their home. The young man had dinner, and after dinner, the, the young woman's mother said to her father, why don't you go and 
get to know this young man a little bit better. So the man invited the young man into his study where they, where they talked for some time. And the, the father of the young man's fiancée said, what is it that you do? And this young man who was very pious and very religious said, I study the scriptures. I'm a biblical scholar. And the father said, that's fine, but what will you do to help provide for my daughter if you are to marry her? And he said, well, sir, I will continue to study the scriptures, and I know that God will provide for us. And the father said, that's wonderful, great. Uh, how, how will you then um, provide, how do you plan on providing for children if you are to have them? And the, the young man said, don't worry about that. I will study the Bible, and God will provide for us. The father continued to ask along this line of questioning, and one after another, the answers came along the same line that God would provide all that this young, family, young man's family would ever need. Afterwards, the, the mother asked, while they were washing dishes together, the mother asked the father, well, how did it go? And the father said, well, he has no plan, and he has no job, and he thinks that I am God. <laughs> Surely we have known things going south sometimes when, when this theology breaks down. We sometimes realize that this is, that kind of theology is not deep enough to sustain us uh, or to provide for our needs in the long run. Uh, this kind of faith is sometimes um, preached in churches, and it's some kind of a false idol. It's a lesser form of the Christian teaching. But our scriptures today teach us to return to a faith in God alone, a faith based on commandments that call us to a loving relationship with God and with one another in all that we do. Recently, I spoke with a woman who found our church after trying different churches in our area, and she said that other churches, uh, many of them are growing very quickly, but sometimes she felt that they had what she called a feel-good message that each time they met, it was about feeling good. It was about lifting the spirits, but perhaps not getting much deeper than that message. And we have had a history and a heritage in Orange County of megachurches, of huge churches that are televised and very prosperous in their ministry. And they do reach many people and many souls. I like to think of these churches as feeding the starving. And they give that badly needed bread. But at some point, people need more than just that bread. They need to be nourished and challenged and strengthened in our faith. And then we return to the commandments, to the whole law, to the teaching that calls us to love our neighbor and even our enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. The challenging teachings that make us uncomfortable when Jesus speaks them to us. This is the food that sustains lifelong growth in Christian faith, the, the growth that John Wesley called sanctifying grace, the process of being sanctified or perfected throughout our lives. A friend of mine, uh, Reverend Wes Neal, used to be a pastor up in the greater Los Angeles area, and at that church they had a moderately sized Methodist church, but it also hosted a thriving Spanish-speaking ministry with, with many hundreds of people filling that sanctuary every Sunday afternoon. The pastor of that church once pulled Pastor Wes aside and said, how do you do it? And Pastor Wes said, what do you mean? He said, how do you keep people in the church for their whole life long? He said, I noticed that your church, this host church, um, the congregation has people who were born in this congregation and will die in this congregation. They continue to grow throughout their lives. And Wes answered that it's because of this emphasis on lifelong learning and obedience to God's teaching. Sanctifying grace that, it, that perfects us more and more throughout our lives. This is the goal of a United Methodist teaching. This is what John Wesley taught, that we are saved through provenient and then justifying grace. We are made right with God, but then that process continues, and we grow deeper and deeper in our connection to God's Spirit. We return to God's teachings through the Ten Commandments and through 
the challenging, wonderful teachings of Jesus. Sometimes these aren't soft on the ears. They aren't necessarily feel-good messages, but they do root us deeper in the love of God. Amen? I remember uh, in a previous congregation, a couple coming to me after church saying, Pastor, we don't always like your messages. And I, <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry to hear that. What's, what is it that you don't like? And they said, sometimes they don't make us feel good. And I said, I'm sorry. Neither does Jesus. <laughs> sometimes Jesus challenges us and makes us feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he inspires us in the knowledge of his grace and forgiveness and promise of, the promise of life everlasting in his name and by his grace and forgiveness is what frees us and gives us cause to celebrate. But sometimes it's not easy to hear. And this is why in our reading from Philippians, Paul teaches them, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Always. Through all suffering, through all challenging growth, through the challenge of loving our enemies, forgiving those who have harmed us, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Remain gentle in all things. Can we do that? As a church, it's hard to do sometimes when we don't agree, but be gentle, even as we speak the truth in love, even as we disagree. The Lord is near, he says. Do not worry about anything, but by ev in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Keep that spirit of thanksgiving in all that you do, even as you go back and practice the difficult, challenging teachings of Christ. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What an encouraging word this is. There is a peace that passes understanding. There's a peace that is deeper than the feel-good message. There is a peace which feeds us and sustains us, even in the valley of the shadow of death, as our choir has sung this morning. Let us draw near to the one true God, knowing that in God alone we find our true peace. These wonderful words of Scripture, this promise, calls us to unite as a church to be one, even when it's a challenge to do so. I was so inspired this past week by how people came together in the wake of these fires, in the wake of the devastation. It was a frightening week, wasn't it? We felt the winds blowing from the direction of those fires, even threatening the, the safety of this church. But we had people, um, people coming together and calling uh, very, very often about those who lived in that area, who live in the Anaheim Hills, because we do have members who live in the eastern portion of Anaheim. Thankfully, there were many, many people who were calling about them, and thanks be to God, everyone was safe and their, their homes were preserved and their lives were as well. I was inspired by one church member who said, why don't we call the Red Cross and offer our church as a shelter, as an evacuation site for the community? And so I did that. I, I called the Red Cross and left a message, and they got back to me and said, we don't need you right now, but for future disasters, we very well might. So thank you. we thank you so much. We have your contact information. I was grateful to that church member who thought to ask me to call that, that agency. Reverend Paige Eves, uh, who used to be an associate pastor at this church and is now the senior pastor at University United Methodist in Irvine, said that she was ready to come up and bring a team of volunteers whenever we needed them to come up and, and help out as well. Um, many people have contacted us to let them know, let us know that not only their words and prayers, but also their actions are ready to help. It's good to see the church truly being the church, amen? To see people going beyond word and showing through action their deep faith in the love of Jesus Christ. This is not a self-centered faith. It's not any kind of a shallow or idol-worshiping faith. It's not selfish, but genuine and constant and generous. And it's good to see that that faith in God alone is strong here at Anaheim United Methodist Church. 
So let us set aside all lesser gods. Let us offer our truest devotion to God so that when we sit by the one who is sick or lonely or grieving, we may rejoice in the Lord always. When we seek as a church to sow seeds of peace in a violent world, we continue to rejoice in God always. When we summon the strength to love and forgive each other, even when it is hard to do, we rejoice in the bonds between us that grow even stronger in Jesus' name. So let us worship together the one true God, so that God's just and peaceable kingdom may reign upon the earth as it does in heaven. May it be so. Let us pray. Loving God, our eternal parent, you teach us and guide us. You give us good commandments which make us strong in our faith with you and in our friendships with one another. Though we sometimes fall away and worship lesser gods, you restore our faith and your love is steadfast. Sometimes our hearts are fickle and we chase after false gods and idols but you are generous and steadfast in your faithfulness. Center us today in your compassion and your peace. Ground us in the good soil of Christ's greatest, most challenging and wonderful commands. When we lose focus and begin to pursue lesser ambitions, call us back to you and give us courage to fulfill your true teachings. We thank you for your church and for the faith community which sustains us, especially in the face of natural disasters. Lord, at this time we confess that our hearts are weary of hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, and violence perpetrated by human beings. Yet we trust that your saving work carries on in the face of all of these. And this world needs your church now more than ever. Be especially with those who continue to fear wildfire destruction in Northern California, even at this moment. Repair the lives of survivors. Comfort the hearts of those who have lost loved ones to those fires. O Holy Spirit, whether we weep with you or give thanks in your name, help us to continually rejoice in your love among us, your grace which forgives us, for we share in these blessings your grace and your love now and always as we remain united as your church. For we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us.